It is well with our soul. We are delighted to be in the house of the Lord today. So good to have you. We welcome you to HFA via live stream. Please know that you're in our thoughts and in our prayers, and we are so glad that you decided to join us today. A big shout out to each and every one of you that are viewing, and we greatly appreciate uh, the fact that you've taken time out of your busy schedules today to spend time with us as we look together at the Word of God. Before we get into the message today, I would like to read in your hearing a letter from a family that attended here for a period of time, the Ogradniks, and perhaps you remember Jerry as well as his wife, Alyssa, and their little girl, Nora. They wrote a beautiful letter to us. They have recently moved to Pennsylvania, and I thought I would share it with you. It says, Dear Pastor Jeff and Pastor Trevor, we would just like to take a minute to properly say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making us feel welcome while we were a part of HFA Church. We only wish we had had more of an opportunity to know you both more and to be more involved while we lived in the area. Please extend a special thank you to the amazing nursery workers who loved on Nora, and even cared for her while she had a broken leg and was in a brace. Nora misses her friends at HFA, especially little Esther. Pastor Jeff, thank you for being a true shepherd to the church. Thank you for bringing truth each week along with love. We admire the way that you lead. We love how you know everyone and care about each one. Your love for God is evident. Pastor Trevor, thank you for your warmth toward us. You made us feel at home. You took a real interest in us and we so greatly appreciated it. We love how genuine you are in the way that you allow God to use you. Please also tell Jerry Painter, we said thank you for his friendship and love he extended to us from our very first day at HFA Church. There were many others whose kindness was exactly what we needed and we count it as an answer to our prayers. We will be praying for you. Hope to see you soon. Again, God bless you and keep you in his love, Jerry, Alyssa, and Nora Ogradnik. You know, letters like this are an encouragement, and I just want to tell you that uh, it stands as a testimony to how we as a church family are indeed doing our best to reach out. And you've heard me say many, many times that one of the goals that I have here is that HFA be known as the friendliest church in the Shenandoah Valley. I believe that that's possible. I don't know if we've arrived there yet, but let me say this, we've taken some giant strides toward doing that, and letters like that affirm that. And I want to thank each and every one of you for the way that you reach out to each other, and especially during this time. If you haven't already done so, may I remind you to pick up the phone, call some of your uh, friends in the church, let them know that you're praying for them, you're thinking about them, and uh, also offer your services to them. If there's some need that is there, if you yourself were not able to meet it, please call the church office. We are doing our best to minister to needs. And during this pandemic, we already have ministered to many individuals as well as families uh, by taking by groceries, also by helping with some financial needs and what have you. Uh, please be our ears and our eyes. We are doing our best, Pastor Trevor and myself, along with our board members and contacting families throughout the week and uh, letting you know that we're thinking about you, seeing if there's any needs that we can pray with you about. But please don't hesitate. We're here to serve you and our desire is that and indeed people are ministered to in a mighty way, not just on our live stream as we're bringing forth the word and also leading in a time of worship, but also throughout the week as well. Know that you are not alone. First of all, you have God present with you, but also your church family. Even though we're not meeting in person, we care about you. Our desire is indeed to be a, a visible representation of God's love to you and know that we're just as close as your phone. In case you don't remember the number, and I don't mean to be redundant, but some folks have said, well, I don't know the number at the church. It's 540-433-8687. Again, 540-433-8687. And we're here Monday through Friday from nine to four, and we welcome your phone calls. And also, if you just like to call and uh, pray for us, we welcome that as well And any words of encouragement. And thank you so much again for tuning in. Well, today I wanna to speak to you on the subject of salt and light. And I wanna to begin today by quoting from the greatest sermon that was ever delivered. It is the Sermon on the Mount that you can find in Matthew chapter five, given by Jesus over 2000 years ago. However, I want to remind you that even though this sermon was brought forth over 2,000 years ago, it is just as important for us today as it was for those who were in attendance on the day that Jesus spoke it. Notice the words of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 5, picking up with verse 13 through verse 16. Jesus said this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, 
how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a light lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now let me begin by asking you, what did Jesus mean in this passage? Well, if you'll permit me, I think he was saying, if you're a follower of mine, I want you to live lives that are salty, lives that will make people thirst for God. I want you to live lives that shine my light of grace, of love, of hope and compassion into dark places. But the question is this, what does this look like as individuals who are living in the 21st century? Well, once we have believed and received Christ to become his follower and child, what does it mean for us to want to be a stronger salt and a brighter light as we live out and explain the good news of the gospel to others? Living in the way that Jesus described is indeed an unexpected adventure for each and every one of us as a follower of Christ. When you and I make ourselves available and have prayed to be prepared for whatever the day may hold, we never know what's going to happen next. And how many of you would agree with me? It's an exciting time in which we live. Your day may start out the normal routine, but you never know when God might present you with the opportunity to be salt or light and use you to change someone's eternal destination. That's the unexpected adventure that each of us have before us as a Christian. God wants to use all of us to point individuals to him. Friends, I remind you, we are here for a purpose, and that is to impact our friends and family members for all eternity. So how can this be accomplished in a practical manner? Well, the Gospel of John provides us with the answer in John chapter 1, verse 12. Let me read it to you. But as many as received him, that is Jesus Christ, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Notice the first part is to believe. That means we need to help others to understand and the embrace the truth about who Jesus is and the fact that he came to die on the cross for the express purpose of giving his life as a ransom so that we could be forgiven and adopted into the family of God. The second element of the equation is receive. It's not just enough for people to have a, uh, you know, to passively nod their heads and say that they agree with the information that we have shared about Christ, but rather they need to receive him as their own forgiver and as their own personal master and savior. When they come to both believe the truth and receive the Savior, they then experience the third part of the equation, which is becoming a child of God. So simply stated, the equation is this, believe plus receive equals become. This is the simple but biblical way that all of us can explain the gospel to others. This is where the excitement happens in the Christian life. It's when our prayer life takes on a whole new dimension because we are praying for God to help us and to indeed help individuals to listen for his direction in their lives. Today, we're going to look at three lessons we can learn by asking, if Jesus lived in my house, what would he do? And how would he interact with the neighbors? Well, the gospel reveals to us, first of all, that Jesus placed a high priority on prayer. Jesus would always pray to his heavenly father before he ever embarked on anything important. In fact, Jesus's prayer for spiritually lost people continued up until the last breath that he took on the cross. Scripture records that Jesus prayed for his tormentors actually while the spikes were being driven through his wrists and his feet. And he did this repeatedly. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, friend, if Jesus prayed for his enemies all the way through the torture of the crucifixion, then how can we justify our failure to pray for the people we love and we care about who are living in quiet rebellion against the Lord? If Jesus lived in our house, I believe that he would pray specifically for individuals. 
I believe that he would pray consistently, not becoming discouraged just because things weren't happening in the way that we thought that they should or within the time frame that we thought that they should. And fervently for his neighbors. I ask you this morning, are you doing that? James tells us that the prayers of righteous people make a difference. They're not wasted, but rather they are powerful and they are effective. Can you say amen? James chapter five, verse 16 tells us the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And there is a quote popularly attributed to Mother Teresa that says, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I stop, they don't. Who have you stopped praying for? Who in your life do you love? Who in your life do you want to see receive Jesus Christ as their savior? Oh, if you're honest, and if I'm honest, you used to pray regularly for them, but you stopped praying because nothing seems to be happening. But friend, I encourage you, keep praying. And today, when that person comes to mind, pray that God will give you the opportunity to speak to them about receiving Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I literally stand in amazement as I see how God is using this pandemic to help us to get the gospel message outside the four walls of this church. There have been individuals who have come to know Jesus Christ as a result of the gospel going forth via live stream on Facebook and also YouTube and, and the other uh, you know, box cast and, and the other means of media that we have that would never think of darkening a church door. But because God's gospel knows no limitation, it knows no barriers and praise God, God himself has promised us that his word would not return unto him void. I'm glad that it's the good news is going forth that many people have embraced the truth of the gospel, have recognized their need of accepting Jesus Christ into their life. Life, as a result of you and I praying for them and praying ahead of time that even before the message goes forth, oh God, touch hearts, Holy Spirit, convict individuals that they might come to know you as their Savior and Lord. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ always spent time in prayer and so should we learn from his example. But the second thing that I noticed that if Jesus were to live in our house, I believe that he also would welcome questions from those that he came in contact with. Jesus might ask something like this, do you have a doubt? Do you have an objection? Is there an obstacle that, that you don't have a full understanding about in embracing the truth of the gospel? Come on in, let's talk about it. Now I can't think of an incident anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus shunned anyone who had a sincere question. One of the best examples of Jesus welcoming questions from this is found in the story of John the Baptist. If anyone should have known the identity of Jesus, you would think it would have been John the Baptist who once pointed at Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in John 1.29. You remember that John also baptized Jesus baptized Jesus and saw the heavens open up and heard the voice of the Father say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John himself had earlier said of Jesus, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God in John 1, 34. However, life is filled with strange twists. And John had gotten arrested and thrown into prison. Now, what happens to us when tough times come along? Well, we find ourselves beginning to have doubts. We find ourselves beginning to question and things that we had never thought about before begin to creep into our mind, right? And the same thing happened to John. So he asked a couple of his followers to go to Jesus and ask him directly, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So they did. Now, how did Jesus react to their coming and behalf of John and asking questions. Did he get angry? Absolutely not. In Luke 7, 22, Jesus said this, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind received their sight, praise God. The lame walk, 
Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And friends, I stand before you today excited, and I can tell you with an assurance that same Jesus is alive. And as we celebrated last week, resurrecting victorious over the death, over hell, over the grave, is the same Jesus today that is still allowing the blind to receive their sight, whether it be physical blindness or spiritual blindness. The lame also who are Christians by different things that have happened in their life. And indeed, it has left its mark upon them. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ restores strength and the lame go walking and leaping and praising God. Those who have indeed been infected by sin, the leprosy of sin, are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is still being proclaimed to every living creature that Jesus Christ has come to seek and save those who are lost. In other words... Jesus was saying to the disciples of John, go back and tell John about the evidence that you have witnessed with your own eyes that convinces you, I am who I claim to be. Now, did this incident affect how Jesus viewed John? On the contrary. After this incident, Jesus said, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Look, friends, bottom line is this. It's okay for us to have questions. It's okay for us to even have doubts as long as we do what John the Baptist did. Seek answers. The good news is that you and I have answers to the toughest questions of faith and life. That's why we've worked so hard to create a safe place here at our church at HFA. It's a place where believers And spiritual seekers alike feel free to be honest about the doubts that they have. We want to be ready to engage those questions and respond in honest, compassionate, and respectful manner. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 instructs us to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. To be salt and light means helping our friends find the answers to their questions. So many people have a spiritual sticky point that's holding them back in their journey toward God. Friends, I submit to you that they need a safe place to explore their questions and they need someone to come alongside of them and help them to understand. It may not be the church building here at HFA, but it may very well be your living room. It may very well be your kitchen table. It may very well be in your driveway or in the workplace or wherever it may be. But as they become comfortable with you, then when you invite them to church, they'll say, well, if there are other people at the church like you, yeah, I want to come and check it out. You see, they need a safe place, as we said to explore their questions, where they're not going to be judged, where they're they're not going to be criticized, where they're not going to be preached to, but rather they need someone to come alongside and help them to understand. Christian author Lee Strobel says this, we have an unfair advantage in the marketplace of ideas. Why? Because we have truth on our side. We have truth on our side. Amen? Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And how many of you know that when you have Jesus on your side, you always have the upper hand? Did you catch that? Truth is on our side. Because of that, we don't need to be afraid of questions. Don't shut down the opinions of those whose beliefs may differ from ours. But instead, by encouraging open discussion and intelligent debate, we allow opportunities for the truth of Christ to come shining through. While debates can be dramatic and powerful, for most of us, the key word is not debate, but dialogue. It's about discussions. It's about friendships and relationships. And instead of a form of apologetics where Christians blast opponents with a barrage of facts, we can engage in a new approach of relational apologetics. This is where we invite spiritually curious friends and neighbors into a safe environment where we can engage with them listen to them, and validate them as people. Friends, I've been encouraged as I've had different individuals in the church call me and tell me, hey, guess what? My neighbor or a coworker of mine or a friend of mine, you know, they were, they were asking me, what's our church website and, and, and how can I watch it and whatever? And, and, you know, our viewership has more than tripled to the glory of God. 
I don't say that to brag because, you know, I, I want you, uh, if, if I'm doing any bragging at all, it's bragging on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That which the devil meant to try to stifle the gospel, to try to, you know, prohibit Christians coming together and meeting together in person. Oh, how many of you know that the word of God cannot be snuffed out? Even hell itself has tried to trample it down from the time that Jesus was born as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. Thank God, our God is triumphant. He is victorious and he is still living and reigning and ruling on high. And because of that, when the word of God goes forth, it always produces a bountiful harvest. When we engage individuals in a safe environment, we listen to the questions that we have and we attempt to answer them in a godly and a polite and respectful manner. It validates them as people. So I encourage you, be respectful, be authentic, and walk with them on their journey as they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord. Third thing we find out about Jesus if he lived in our house is this, that he lived an authentic faith. Jesus lived an authentic faith. Talk is cheap, and living out an authentic faith takes more than just words. Jesus didn't just say he loved the world, but rather he demonstrated it by being a servant. Jesus served the sick by restoring their health. And in the ultimate act of servanthood, he gave his life to pay for the sins of the world. When you and I sacrificially serve others as Jesus did, it opens up hearts otherwise that would be closed to the gospel message. Remember what it says there in Matthew 5, 16? Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In this verse, the Greek word for good doesn't just refer to good as opposed to bad, but rather it means winsome and attractive. Our authentic acts of service are attractive and can draw others toward Christ. If Jesus lived in my house, if Jesus lived in your house, his authentic living would include a compassion radar. What do your neighbors need? Well, Maybe an elderly neighbor would be grateful if you ran some errands for them. And I realize that we are living in a time where social distancing is in a fact, but when the pandemic passes, and it will, it will pass, I, I believe that it, you know, we're, we're nearing the date where indeed we'll be able to socially interact with one another. It may be different than what it was before, but as those barriers are taken down, those mandates or are, are, uh, restrictions are removed, perhaps there's a single mom who lives near to you that needs babysitting, or maybe a lonely child just needs somebody to spend some time with them and shoot some baskets with them or throw the baseball with. You see, serving those around us in one respect is living authentic faith. Another is simply living in a way in which what you see is what you get. Jesus lived a life of consistency, congruency between his character and his creed, between his beliefs and his behavior question that I would pose to you today is this. What do our neighbors see in us? What do our neighbors see in us? They're looking to see if your life authentically matches your faith. Friends, most people today are not looking for a perfect person, but rather they're looking for someone who's real. They want to see an individual whose actions match the words that they say. I don't know about you, but when I hear that, Integrity is the word that comes to mind. People need to witness individuals being transparent about the realities of life. They need to know if God is or can be a part of everyday life's experiences. Many find themselves asking such questions. Does God really care about the mental and emotional and spiritual wounds that I have? Does he care that I need a place to live? Can I ever be a whole and a healthy person again? Is it possible? Is it possible for me to really function as a healthy human being? Friends, let's not be guilty of offering cliches like you just need to have more faith or you just need to pray more, but rather be genuine, be transparent. Let people know that you have questions of your own. I remind you, our goal is to represent Jesus Christ to others. Our goal is to represent 
Jesus Christ to others. When others look at your life, when others look at my life, do they see Jesus? Do they see something that is different there? Do they see us indeed not being alarmed or shaken by the events that are taking place in the world around us because we know in who it is that our hope is anchored? In knowing that just as the faithfulness of Christ has been there for us in the past, Praise God, he's there for us now in the present and will be in the future. That no matter what the future holds, and all I know you've heard this before, but we know who holds the future, praise God. You see, we can change the world one life at a time by being a reflection of Jesus Christ to others. And when we do, we open the door to God's amazing love that allows us to explain the truth of Christ to others. Simply put, our role is to be ready and willing because God is always able. Did you hear that? Simply put, our role is to be ready and willing because God is always able. He is the great evangelist. We're merely the tools that he uses to fulfill his mission of redeeming the world one individual at a time. So friend, Let's make it our mission as individuals and collectively as a church to be salt and light to a world that is searching for answers to life questions because Jesus Christ has come to give us life and life abundantly. I am so thankful that you and I have a message of hope that we can bring forth today. And just as salt preserves, it also makes individuals thirsty. May you and I present the gospel in such a way that people are thirsty to know more about Jesus Christ. Also that we will be a light shining forth into a world of darkness that dispels the darkness. And as the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ is presented in the way that you and I conduct ourselves by being authentic in our faith because we spend time in prayer asking God for opportunities and asking God for wisdom beyond ourselves, that we welcome questions that individuals had, and we were ready to discuss with them in a friendly and welcoming environment. And as we shared with them, we showed them compassion, we showed them genuine interest in helping them to come to an understanding, and then believing that as we did so, that Jesus Christ in his faithfulness would indeed Draw all men unto himself, all women unto himself, all boys, all girls unto himself, that none would perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I challenge you today, let's be salt. Let's be light, not only during this pandemic, but throughout the remainder of time that God grants us to be here on this earth. Let's make a difference because I believe that Jesus Christ is coming and he's coming very soon. Are you ready? Pray with me. Father, I thank you today. I'm thankful today that you laid aside the splendor of all of heaven, came down and dwelt among us as a man and lived a sinless and a perfect life so that you could be the perfect sacrifice that was needed to atone on our behalf for our sins. Lord, with the shedding of your blood, you paid the price once and for all the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, who came down and willingly took our place on the cross of Calvary to pay a price for sin that we could never pay on our own. But God, you loved us that much. Lord, because of that, we now, when we call upon the name of Jesus, with a repentant heart, confessing that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and confessing with our mouth that you are the only begotten Son of God who takes away the sins of the world, that when I invite you into my life, as my Lord, as my personal Savior, Lord, you wash away my every sin, my every transgression. And not just for me, but for all mankind. No, friend, I would implore you today, if you're watching this live stream and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, oh, know today that he loves you. He demonstrated that love through his crucifixion, through his death on the cross of Calvary. But praise God, the grave could not hold him captive, but he rose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave three days later. And because of that, he now is offering you this wonderful free gift of salvation. If you need the Lord today, the Holy Spirit's been tugging at your heartstring. I would just ask that you pray the following prayer along with me today. 
Pray together with me. Dear Jesus, I ask today that you would come into my life as my Lord and Savior. I know that I'm a sinner. I know, Lord, I can't pay the price for my sin. But you did through your death on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, because of the shedding of your blood, you now have made it possible for me to become a child of God. So today, Lord, I invite you into my life. I ask, Lord, that you would wash away my every sin. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and give me the assurance of knowing that my sins are forgiven and that I am a child of God. I thank you, Lord, that you're not a respecter of persons, but Lord, you've said, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. So today, Lord, that's exactly what I'm doing. I pray that you will give me the ability, Lord, to be a child of God from this day forward. Give me a hunger. Give me a thirst for the word. Give me, Lord, a desire to know you in a more meaningful way that I may know that you are my God and I am your child. Thank you for hearing my prayer and for saving my soul. I love you, Jesus, and I confess that you are the Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, amazing gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And friend, today as you pray that prayer, I assure you that Jesus Christ has removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. That's what the word of God tells us. Look it up for yourself. There in Psalm 103, Jesus Christ today personally is embracing you, drawing you to himself and saying, welcome home, my son, my daughter. Jesus Christ wants to be your Lord. And today my prayer is that you will taste of the Lord and see that he is good. I want to close this morning by simply thanking those of you who have been faithful in your giving. We thank you so much for your faithfulness. And because of that, we've been able to minister, as we said, to many families in need, as well as continuing to support our missionaries. Also wanted to remind you, we do have available the upper room that uh, is the devotional for May and June. So if you come by the church uh, to drop off your tithe or for whatever reason that you might want to come by the church, we do have these available and we'll be more than happy to see that you receive a copy of that. Remember to call each other, stay in contact. If you are aware of any needs in our congregation family, please make us aware of it. We're doing our best to attempt in reaching out, ministering to people during this time. And thank you from the abundance of my heart for uh, just tuning in and watching us on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, as well as on Wednesdays. Be quick to share comments uh, on your Facebook friends and, and share the broadcast with others. Tell them about the live stream that is taking place, that they can watch it either on our church website or watch it on Facebook as well. Um, you know, I, I'm so thankful that we are getting the gospel message out beyond the four walls of the church. There's no telling what our God can and will do as we are faithful in serving him. May the Lord richly bless you. I pray that this week is just going to be a fantastic week, that God is going to provide you with opportunities to be a witness to your neighbors and be sure to be salt and light in making a difference in this time. God richly bless you, and may indeed the Lord keep you in his safe and protective care. Have a great week.